Um, we have 2D crystals, and we take a picture and Fourier transform, and we see spots in the Fourier transform, right? Um, if we would have a 3D crystal, then in Fourier space, you have a 3D Fourier space with lots of spots. And what you do at the synchrotron is you take this crystal and rotate it, and each time you record a diffraction pattern, and the diffraction pattern shows some of these spots. And once you have measured amplitudes for all of these spots, you invent the phases with some tricks, and then you have your data set collected. That's 3D crystallography, very powerful and efficient. We have seen um, that from many works. But, but now we have 2D crystals, and the 2D crystal is toroidic in X and Y, but in Z, there's only one thing. And this one thing, so nothing, something, nothing, gives a sync function in 3D space. And that means our 3D space we are looking for has lines of intensities and amplitudes and phases um, separated by, by nothing, by zeros. And we try to measure the amplitudes and phases of this thing in Fourier space. And when we have done this, we can go to the CCP4 software and say, out of this data set, please show me the map. Um, and what we do now is we take our picture. Here's the picture, the shadow. And we fully transform this. And these are the, it's the fully transform you are dealing with. And you see these spots, which is when our non-tilted plane cuts through, through these lines. This is why our Fourier transform shows these spots. And now when you tilt, um, and I probably should stop this. So when you tilt your, your crystal in the microscope to 60 degrees and you take your picture, the picture shows uh, is distortion. And the more you tilt, the more distortion you have, right? It gets shorter here. Um, and the Fourier transformation of this now fits into the, your Fourier space as a tilted line, tilted plane. And it will cross on the tilt axis here, the horizontal plane, but then up here it will cross these lattice lines, these lines, higher and here lower. Yeah, and so a picture of a tilted crystal will give you information about the, the lattice lines the, in Fourier space up higher and up lower here. So this is the goal. We take pictures and populate our Fourier space. Um, and now, if we focus on what these lines are, they're called lattice lines. Yeah, because in Fourier space, we have a lattice, and those are spots if you look at one Fourier transformation. But in reality, those are lines where we just got a spot here at one measurement. And these lattice lines, um, if you just take one lattice line, from here upwards and put it horizontal. Then we have here the lattice line from center upwards. And on, along this lattice line, we have some amplitude values. And the amplitude values, they have some funny numbers between, in this case, between zero and 200 or so, yeah? And they go higher and lower, which means more amplitude, less amplitude, more amplitude, less amplitude, yeah? There's some Amplitude distribution and it's continuous. It's not spots as in 3D crystallography. It's continuous lines. And we also have phase values. Phases go from minus 180 to plus 180. And plus 181 is the same as minus 179. Yeah? So this is the phase distribution along this lattice line. And our goal is for all the lattice lines to measure the numbers for the amplitudes and phases along this here, and then we have measured everything and we can ask this before to make a map. Um, and the problem is that we can only tilt to 60 degrees, yeah, not more than the sample holder gets into the way, and so we can never measure the amplitudes and phases in, within this missing cone. And this is why Brian Gibson and our group had developed an algorithm to fill these data with additional knowledge. But that's a different topic which we will not touch here. Um, but we are in the process of, or we plan to put this also into 2DX in the end to fill the missing cone information. So now we need to know, in order to do this, we need to know what the tilt angle is. Yeah? We need to know exactly um, uh, here. Where's the tilt axis? How much tilt do we have? Um, and so then we know 
how to put these measurement Fourier transformations into our 3D Fourier space. Yeah. So what we need to know is the tilt axis. Yeah. Is it tilted this way or that way or, or this way? That's the tilt axis. Or maybe here. Yeah. And by how much? A little bit or a lot? Yeah. That's the tilt angle. And um, you need to be able to measure that and quantify that and tell it to the MRC software. And Richard Hennison came up with a convention, and we will put all these slides on the server later, and the recording is also on there. So you don't have to take notes, but this will be then there. Richard Henderson came up with a convention how to quantify that. And he said, the first thing you need to know is the tilt axis. Where is this? This is your, um, your film from the, from the microscope with a little notch there, the Kodak film. Um, and it has a horizontal x-axis and a y-axis. Yeah? And so the first question is, where is the tilt axis? And the tilt axis is specified by a variable called TLT axis. And it measures the angle from the x-axis to the tilt axis. So in this case, um, this would be minus 30 degrees or so. From the x-axis, positive would be counterclockwise. Positive in mathematics is always counterclockwise. This tilt axis from the x-axis would be minus 30 degrees. That's how the tilt axis is on your micrograph. And the next variable is how much is it tilted? 45 degrees or 30 degrees? Um, yeah, if this is up and this is down, then this could be 45 degree tilt or so. Yeah, that's the tilt angle. Um, so far, you can do this with just your carbon film. You don't need a crystal. These two variables describe your carbon film, the grid in the microscope. And then the next variable is called tilt axa. It's the angle from the tilt axis, the dotted line, to your first uh, vector in uh, reciprocal space um, or real space and defines how your crystal is. A star is the reciprocal space. So here the tilt axis goes down and the A star axis goes to the right. So this is probably plus 10 degrees or so would be tilt axa. And this defines how the crystal lies on your carbon film. Um, and then from the point of view of the crystal, if you were the crystal, uh, there's two more variables that describe for you as the crystal how you feel. And the first is called the tangle, the tilt angle. And it just says um, how much are you tilted. And if your grid was tilted by 45 degrees, you are also feeling 45 degree tilt. But the question is in which direction? Is it plus 45 or minus 45? And this, this depends on how the, the crystal was, for example, lying on the carbon film. Was it lying like this or like that? Yeah. Some crystals, P3 crystals, they have an upside-up or upside-down orientation. And so you can feel on your head or up or down. Yeah? And the other angle is taxa, which is um, if you are the crystal, where across your unit cell is the tilt axis. Um, and this is from the tilt axis to a star in the crystal. So these two, taxa and tangle, are from the point of view of the crystal, and the first two are the f for the grid, which doesn't even need a crystal to do that. And tilt axa defines how the crystal lies on your grid. This sounds confusing, um, and because it sounds confusing, we recently renamed these. Um, the first two uh, concern the grid, and we called them grid tilt axis and grid tilt angle. Yeah, which is the first two? They define first two. Uh, the first two define the grid tilt axis and the grid tilt angle. Yeah. And then um, the other ones we called crystal tilt axis and crystal tilt angle because they refer to the crystal. So if you were the crystal, how would you feel? Tilted and in which direction? So, um, now um, we have in, uh, four ways to measure these. The first two are important, and then the last two is from the point of view of the crystal. So the first way to measure these is by looking at the defocus on the film, or the negative. Yeah? Um, Nikol Gigoyev programmed a program called CTF Search, 
that does that. It measures the defocus on the image. And if this would be your image, then, and here are these numbers, these numbers are supposed to show you the defocus. Yeah? Can I zoom this up? So, and if you have defocus measurements, if, and Nico's program does that, this internally, and you have 12,000 angstrom defocus here, and 7,000 there, and 5,000 there, and 10,000 there, then you could imagine the tilt axis somewhere here. This is little defocus, this is a lot of defocus. Yeah, so just from the defocus variations across the film, how the ton rings change. Here you have many ton rings, here very few. You could find out the, the tilt geometry. And this is what we do in 2DX also um, by using Nico de Wurf's program or by using our own version. Um, so the defocus gradient then gives you the first two variables for your carbon film or the grid, how it's tilted. And once you have a crystal on there, also the last two variables show the, how the crystal is tilted. Another way to find out the tilt geometry is from lattice distortions. Yeah, you saw here in this, in this road tilting movie, when the crystal is tilted, then the picture is shortened. Yeah, and that uh, in Fourier space means it's elongated, reciprocal space. Um, that also gives you distortions of your crystal lattice, and if you quantify these distortions precisely, you can find out what the um, tilt geometry is. And this is done by a program that David Agar programmed, um, EM Tilt, some time ago. I think it was David Agar. Um, and we employ that. The third way to find out what the tilt geometry is, is by fitting spot splitting in your Fourier transformation of highly tilted images. Um, MRC programs TT Refine, for example, do that. And I will explain what, later what that is. And the last way to refine the tilt geometry is during merging. If you have a 3D reconstruction of your protein and you have a map, you can just compare the map with your 3D reconstruction and say, well, this map looks like top left. Yeah? So this is what single particle reconstruction also does. You rotate your sample and say, well, this, this map looks, looks to me like this direction. And um, the program Auric Tilt can do that. It can refine the tilt geometry by just comparing your picture with your 3D reconstruction. And so in the end, um, you have defocus gradient or lattice distortion or spot splitting or the merging step. In the merging step, you only deal with the crystal, so you don't know what the carbon film looked like. But you can compare your crystal with your picture. And so in 2DX, we have um, at the bottom right um, these four columns with numbers. And the first two numbers show how the grid was tilted, and the last two numbers show how the crystal felt itself tilted, being tilted. And these four measurements should hopefully agree with each other. Otherwise, you have somewhere a problem. Yeah, so the defocus says the tilt axis is 63 degrees. Lattice distortion says 64. That's more or less the same. Spot splitting also, and this, this is a very nice example. Tilt angle from defocus gradient says 42 degrees, but if your magnification calibration is a little bit off, this value will be wrong. Lattice distortion said 45 degrees. That's better. That's more reliable. And spot splitting also says the same. Suspiciously close, actually. There may be something wrong. Um, and then you can translate that into the point of view of the crystal for the last two variables um, and also compare this what auric tilt gets if comparing that with the 3D reconstruction and these should also agree with each other. Um, so in 2DX this is this panel here at the bottom right. Yeah? This is all from a very bad example. So defocus says this is 16 degrees tilted, but the lattice distortion is in a completely different direction and merge gets still another. So the 3D comparison gets still another uh, answer. So here you can't trust the tilt geometry at all. It's a bad example. It just took any image that I had open. It's even a non-tilted image, so everything is nonsense here. But if you go to a tilted image, this one is 30 degree tilted. Doesn't have anything there. Ah, do I have something that is tilted and processed? This one here. This is 45 degree tilted. Defocus says the tilt axis is roughly horizontal, 14 degrees, minus 14. Tilt angle 46, lattice says 47. 
and Mergen says 44.5. And on the microscope in Frankfurt, we said we use the 45 degree sample holder. So it should be close to 45. Yeah? So this one you could trust. Okay, so this is the definition of the tilt geometry. Um, this is what I just said. Defox gradient, lattice distortion, spot splitting of really merging. Um, and I think I will just set all this. So in 2DX, we have two uh, ways, two functions to look at tilt geometry. One is if you look at your raw picture with spot scanning, with masking, and the crystal is underneath. And so maybe there isn't even a crystal, it's just an artifact picture. You can still see where is less under focus and where's more under focus and where's your tilt axis and the tilt angle. Yeah, and you get this with a button T. So if I have a picture, this one, and I go to the um, image, downsampled image, and I press T, then it says top here, oh, less under focus, more under focus, and the tilt axis is here, minus 14 degrees. This is minus 14. And the tilt angle is plus 46 degrees. That, that is the button T. Yeah, so here, yeah, view the tilt axis in the raw image, T. And then there's this other button, Shift T, which is the tilt axis in the final map. Um, that's a different thing. So if we are in the final map here, and you look at the, the final map, this one, then I have to press the button Shift T. Yeah. And then we, we don't have more or less under focus. We have higher, physically higher and physically lower. And here the tilt axis is from the point of view of the crystal. Yeah. And in this map, it does not make sense to, to press the T button yeah? because the, there's no more under focus or less under focus in your final reconstruction. Here you have to press the shift T button, which is this one. And in the raw picture, you have to press the other button. Yeah? So in this raw picture here. It does not make sense to look at higher and lower. It, you have to press T, which is more under focus and less under focus. And you can compare this more under focus and less under focus also with this, with this um, function here. In some images you see ton rings. Um, I don't see ton rings in this image. But you see ton rings and they should, they should breathe and move. Uh, let me see if I can find ton rings here. Yeah, I see a ton ring. And this ton ring, can you see a ton ring there? It should breathe, yeah, so a little bit. Yeah, can you see that? It, it's closer to the origin. This is less defocus, more defocus. Less defocus, more defocus, yeah? Less and more. And so this should be shown here. Um, this is less defocus and more defocus. And then you know, okay, this, this is correct. Yeah, the ton ring, more defocus should have smaller ton rings and less defocus should have wider ton rings. And you can just test this here. So I need to take this away. More defocus, less defocus. Yeah? And so you can verify if that's correct. Okay, this is this thing that you have these two different tilt geometries for the carbon film T and for the final map shift T. And if you have higher resolution and you have alpha helices that you see in your pictures and you have your protein from the top and then look at it from the side, then the alpha helices are, um, from the side are like lines. And here you can see these lines and they should be perpendicular to the tilt axis in the final map. Yeah. Okay. On non-tilted images, this is the processing that we did, and we discussed that before. And on, and there's the CTF correction. We had this yesterday. And now, how does the CTF look like if a sample is tilted? The defocus is not a certain number. The defocus changes more and less defocus. And this is called the tilted transfer function. This is the contrast transfer function for a tilted sample. Um, we had this thing here yesterday, yeah, so, sorry. 
Um, if you change the defocus, your CTF changes and you have for one certain frequency, positive and negative and positive and negative um, contrast, depending on when you sit there and slowly over-focus and under-focus, yeah? then you would have this. Now, if you imagine, if your, if your sample is this line pattern, then your picture shows these lines, yeah? black, white, black, white, black, white, and in your Fourier transformation, you see one single reflection on the right and one on the left, so one single peak. Now, if you tilt your, or if you measure the amplitude, you measure a certain amplitude of, for example, 100, and you measure the background, and the background is very low, and this is an IQ1 spot, it's an excellent signal-to-noise level. Yeah, so this is non-tilted, that's easy. If you now tilt your crystal in the microscope, then depending on the a lot of under-focus or little under-focus, you have this contrast variation. Sometimes you have strong contrast, no contrast, inverted contrast, no contrast, strong contrast. Yeah? We had this animation. And this one spacing here becomes positively contrasted, invisible, negatively contrasted, invisible. Um, and if you look at this profile here, you have strong contrast, no contrast, wrong contrast, no contrast. And this corresponds to your sinus wave modulated with the second sinus wave. Um, it's a beating, yeah? and in free space, this leads to two spots instead of one. So this is the spot splitting. If you have a tilted crystal at higher resolution, then instead of having one reflection in free space, you have two. This is spot splitting, and it's worse if you have more tilt, and it's worse if you have higher resolution or and are further away from the tilt axis. And now comes the MRC software and measures the the intensity and says there is no spot and then it measures the background and says wow there is huge background yeah and then your IQ value is 9 yeah because there is zero signal and lots of background and then you don't measure anything and your tilted image says well there is it's just gigantic noise each time where I want to find a spot there is just nothing but next to it there is two gigantic noise peaks and then you get no result and so Richard Hennison found something to do with this Fourier transformation. So this is this spot splitting. Instead of one, you have two. He just calculates what this profile should look like. Um, so what the two dots should look like for every spot position. And then convolutes this with that. And then out of these two peaks, by convoluting it with that, you make three peaks. And now on these three peaks, you can go in and measure the signal. It's, it's a good signal. And then you measure the background just in between. And then you measure a low background. And now suddenly you have an IQ2 spot or IQ1 spot again. Yeah, so you ignore these two sidebands that are there, but you can measure in the middle the signal and you can measure left and right the background. And now it works. And this is implemented in all programs with a TT. There's TT box, TT refine, TT mask three programs and if you have more than 30 degree tilt you should do this so a highly tilted crystal 45 degrees or 60 degrees in free space shows you not only the fraction spots but they are split and the splitting is perpendicular to the tilt axis and gets stronger the further you go away from the tilt axis and if you here try to measure the intensity in the middle, it's zero and the background is huge. Yeah. And Richard Henderson's TT programs convolute this with two dots, then in the end you have three, and then you can measure in the middle the intensity and just next to that the low background. Um, and then Ansgar Philipson, there was a postdoc in Andreas Engel's lab, he spent a lot of time thinking about this problem and came out with a mathematical ground up solution to the whole topic and said actually well it's the spot splitting but it's not exactly as hand waving argumentation shows but it's slightly asymmetric and um, it's much more complex and complicated than we can all imagine and he put that into a nice paper in JSP 2006 um, and, and I think this is implemented in IPLT but the computation time for the deconvolution of this or the um, 
negation is gigantic. And in praxis, I'm, I'm not sure if it's computationally worth to do this. Um, for defocus-adjusted spot scanning, in any case, you don't need this. But this is out there, and this is probably the best mathematical description of the problem. A tilt rest, tilted contrast imaging function. It's not a transfer function. It's not a convolution. It's a complex function. Okay, so in our programs we have, um, when it goes to unbending 2, we have here this, this switch. It's an advanced switch. So in standard you don't have it. If you go to advanced, then you have this apply CTF correction, which is standard. Yeah, you just Wiener filter. Or TTF correction, which means every spot is convoluted with this profile and only then it's evaluated. And you can just choose here which one you want. When I tried this yesterday evening, it crashed. But it worked before, so we have to look into that. But I wanted to demonstrate it. But um, on a 45-degree tilted image, image like this one, you get probably 30% more IQ1 spots than if you don't do it. So at 45 degrees, it's a big advantage. Um, OK, this would be the normal CTF correction. This is all still ton ring affected. So you do all this, and here is the CTF correction with amplitudes and phases. Yeah. This is non-tilted. And if you have it tilted now, then Richard Henderson's programs uh, do this convolution with the profile already here. And from here on, you have no contrast transfer function or tilted transfer function anymore. And this is all free of the transfer function. And so you are not in the CTF or ton ring affected world anymore here. And then you find your profile, and with your profile you can unbend your image. Um, and then you get a very sharp uh, free transform of your unbent image, but it still has the spot splitting. And then here, when you measure amplitudes and phases, this program again does this convolution, and you get your CTF free amplitudes and phases, so you don't need CTF correction anymore. And then you can make your reconstruction. And then when you want to use a synthetic um, reference with uh, Megtron, now we want to make this thing with Megtron using our 3D reconstruction or 2D average. And here we don't, we need to make something that has no defocus applied. Yeah? So before, here Megtron applies defocus to make a nice reference that fits with ton rings. And now we need a reference without ton rings or so. And we have implemented that, and Megtron is not applying the ton ring stuff there. Just a detail, where actually is still ton rings, and where are you without ton rings? Um, that's the last slide. So this is... Okay, and then I wanted... I was looking for a picture where you actually can see spot splitting. Yeah. I think I found one. So this is a Fourier transform. And I'm not sure if that's it, but you you have two spots here, actually everywhere. And the tilt axis is roughly horizontal. So in this Fourier transform, it's 45 degree tilted from uh, the Fujiyoshi type microscope in Frankfurt. Yeah, Werner Kilborn's lab. Yeah. Christina Paulino also works. Yes. Some spot splitting. If you now measure the intensity in the middle, you get a nice zero, and if you measure the, measure the background around that, you get a huge background. But what happens to the phase? Um, yeah, Ansgar Philipson would have a different answer than Richard Henderson, and I don't have any because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the Fourier transformation has a cosinus and sinus term. What we see here is just the modulus of those, but the computer deals with cosinus and sinus, and I guess each of those is convoluted with a map, and yeah, the spot splitting is transformed into three spots for the cosinus and for the sinus map independently, and then the arcus tangus between the two is the phase also after that. So I guess nothing happens to the phases. But Ansgar Philipsen has a different answer, yeah, where the phases do some very funny things. You want here to go to the phase values and, yeah. 
Where is this uh, face? It's O? Oh, and then you say show phases. Okay, and then we go to A spot. So this, let me show some, go to one that is here maybe. So, okay, this one. Uh, then pixel value, rest face. Okay, face is also. So this one has a face of 270, and this one has a face of also 270. The face origin would change both. But MRC, MM box, would try to measure the amplitude and phase here and then get nothing useful. And the background there. Yeah, so. Yeah. So this is the tilted transfer function. Um, so I was here in this one. Okay. And you do this. So unband one is not, is ignoring that topic. And unband two has two algorithms implemented. And one uses the TT programs and the other uses the MM programs, which do CTF correction. And in the first case, if you do a CTF processing, then you need to correct the CTF in the end. And in the second case, which crashed this morning or yesterday night, but then this thing would just uh, skip. So instead of doing anything, it just says no CTF apply needed since TTF correction is already done. And then this script will just not do anything except then uh, dealing with plot, plot risk car, which Anchi wrote. Okay. If there are no further questions, then we can...